Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another session of our American Revolution adventure. And we're going to be coming to you live today from the Army Women's History Museum in Virginia. So it's not nearby here. We're going back out towards the East Coast. And we're going to be joined today by Michaela Procopio. Hi, Michaela. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here with you today. And yeah, Michaela, give us a little preview. What are we going to get to check out in this session today? Okay, cool. So you guys are going to come with me through the museum, and we're going to do something called Spies and Disguise, the American Revolution. And so you guys are going to help um, guess with me if some of these women that we're going to talk about today were either a spy or if they were in disguise. So it's kind of like a little cool uh, detective story as we learn about women in the American Revolution. And classes, this will be interactive so that if you have, she's going to like put a few items up there for you to make decisions on. Be ready to type in the chat your ideas and thoughts as we go along. We're excited to have you with us. All right, Michaela, let's start the tour. Okay, great. So just real quick before we jump in, this is the outside of our museum. So even though uh, you see me inside, this is what it looks like outside. Um, and we are located on an army base. Um, and we are the only museum in the world that tells the story of women um, throughout the U.S. Army all the way back to the beginning, including the revolution. And so that's what we're going to start with today. And we're just going to start with, let me see if I can move him. Yeah, we're going to start with this guy, which I'm sure most of you are very, very familiar with who this is, right? This is pro this is George Washington, right? If you recognize him. And this is a very, very famous painting of the American Revolution done years later, right? Not painted in the exact moment that it happens. And this is a depiction of George Washington and his army crossing the Delaware River right during the American Revolution. And just for a recap really quickly before we dive into our nitty gritty, right? The American Revolution is a war between the colonists, right? These people who make up the 13 colonies of America and the British who uh, oversee these colonies, right? And so a lot of these colonists um, decide that they want to have independence, right? They want to be free from Great Britain. They want to be their own nation and make their own laws. And so they will go to war against the British and they will actually, you know, write this very famous document that you have probably learned about, the Declaration of Independence, declaring their independence from Great Britain and the king. And so we know lots of kind of these famous figures like George Washington, who you see up here, or if some of you know about Hamilton, right? We know about Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. But I think sometimes we forget about the women that were involved in the American Revolution and some of the cool roles that they played. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to this and you guys can kind of see a couple of things up here. There are images and then there are some objects and I'm going to get to the objects in a second, but we really have to understand kind of the roles uh, that women had in this time period. So I'm going to talk for a second, but I want you to start brainstorming the types of jobs that women had during the revolution. And so if you think of some of those jobs, you can go ahead and put them in the chat for me. But what are some of these jobs that you think the women might have had way back during the revolution? And you can maybe get some clues from this image up here in the top left or the bottom. Um, but all of the objects that we're going to talk about in the second are related to these to these roles, to these roles that women had during the American Revolution. And while they're thinking about it. Um, you know, some of these images have a lot of great clues in them, like would these things would have been used inside or outside? Hmm. Would these have been used to complete a task? So we've got one class that thinks um, maybe sewing would have been a job. Oh, that's a great guess, right? And you can probably guess too from this woman up in this image, right? She's she's sewing. Absolutely. Clothes were a big part of jobs that women had. They would have done everything from sewing to mending to washing them, right? Kind of down here in our our bottom right They're They're washing, cleaning. OK, anything with the clothes. Um, 
any other guesses that women might have done during the revolution? A so lot of them. Yep, yeah, another ahead. group is saying that probably making uniforms could have been something. So there may have been sewing things for the Patriots. Yeah, absolutely, right? Making kind of the uniforms for their soldiers, right? Absolutely making the clothes. We kind of know in the beginning of the war that the the Continental Army was a, a hodgepodge of outfits, right? They didn't necessarily have a uniform in the beginning, okay? And definitely making clothes to keep them warm while they were fighting. Okay, anything else? They think um, cooking would be oh, a big part of it? Yes, absolutely. Everything in the kitchen, cooking, cleaning, making the food, you have got it, right? Um, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep going, but if you have guesses, you can still put them in there. So pretty much right. The women are going to do everything in the home because most women couldn't hold jobs at this point, right? So they're not making any money. The money that comes into the home comes from from the husband, from the father. And so women would have done the cooking, the cleaning, the taking care of the children, um, taking care of the family when they were sick and this is pretty much the case all throughout the 13 colonies. So even if your family was wealthy and you had enslaved persons at your home and they did a lot of these chores, the woman was still kind of the head of the household. And so she still did things within the house, right? Um, so they didn't do anything outside of the home. And so now I'm going to show you guys two objects and I call them artifacts. And if you know what an artifact is, you can put the definition in the chat. Um, but I brought two artifacts with me today and you can see two images of them up here on the screen. And I'm going to talk about them a little bit and then I want you to put your guesses into the chat about what you think this object might be. Um, and so an artifact is an object or an item that is made by a human being, right? It's made by a person, it's man-made, right? It's not made by nature. Um, and it tells us something about that specific time period that it comes from. And so the two artifacts that I have today, both have to do with the kitchen, right? And so primarily the person that would have used them would have been a woman. So this is our first object. It's also in this picture right here, kind of next to a teacup. Um, and it's not it's not very heavy. It's kind of like hollow um, and it is a rectangle. Um, it's kind of dark in color and it has these little squares that you can see and they have, you know, symbols on them and it has images on the back. Um, it doesn't really smell. This is not this is not the real thing if you guys are going to ask that because if it was the real thing, it would be very, very, very smelly and very gross. Um, but this is something that would have been used in the kitchen. So maybe what do we think? What are some guesses about what this might be? So one says Mandy thinks it's a tea brick. All right. Well, you guys are just experts on the American Revolution because you got it on the very first guess. This is a tea brick. Um, so, wow, good job. That has never happened before. Like, pat yourself on the back. I'm very, very impressed. Yes, this is a tea brick and it's kind of different because it's not how we think of tea today, right? Um, a tea brick is tea, like the tea leaves that would have been molded into this shape. And if you wanted tea, you could have, you know, broken off a piece and put it in a strainer like up here and then, you know, let it steep in hot water or you could have, could have put it directly in the, cup, in the cup and poured hot water over it, right? And so they were put into these molded shapes, these bricks so that they were easier to transport. Um, I always think these tea bricks are kind of cool, right? Because when you know we first learned about the Boston Tea Party, I always imagined that they were just throwing in crates of like loose leaf tea, right? But they were actually throwing in, you know, like molded tea bricks into the Boston Harbor. Okay, well, let me see if I can stump you with our next artifact. Um, it is this guy and he's up here at the top. He's also not very big. He kind of 
kind of looks like scissors, right? If you can kind of see it doesn't actually close all of the way here. It is silver. It is made out of a uh, steel and iron, and it does kind of have a function like like scissors, but they are not scissors. So let's um, let's take some guesses about what this might be, what object this is. They're thinking <laughs> this one is tricky, although I thought the tea brick was tricky, so you guys might surprise me. I, Emilio just posted that he thinks it was just a decoration. I think he's referring to the tea brick because it did, ha did have a really cool design on it. Yes, yeah. we're trying to take a look at this. Um, one fifth grade class at Woodman Elementary thinks it's maybe pliers. Another okay. class thinks that it's tongs for coal. Okay. And others are saying mm, maybe it's something you use to take things out of the fire. Oh, I love all of those guesses. It does have a similar function to pliers, right? It does kind of look like that. And I do see the idea for tongs, but it would have been quite hard to hold stuff because it is kind of sharp on the inside here. Like you really, it would probably crack. Um, maybe taking something out of the fire, but I don't think it would have had a good grip. Those are all really good guesses. So I'm going to tell you guys what it is. It's kind of surprising. Um, these are called sugar snippers um, and they had one job, which seems kind of silly to us, right? Because usually when we have objects now, they can do lots of different things. Um, but these little tools were specifically made um, for your block of sugar, right? So sugar didn't come in a bag. It came similar in like a like a brick, like the tea brick. And when you needed it, you would pull out your little sugar snippers and you would snip or break off however much uh, sugar you needed. And so it's kind of interesting, right? Because we don't have sugar snippers today anymore, do we? Um, but do we have things that are similar to this tool, right? That kind of do the same thing? Good question. What else could this be? Oh, Michaela, we've lost your sound. Oh, no. Oh, there we go. There we go. OK. <laughs> um, I always think they're really interesting, right? Because you guys made the guesses like pliers or I mentioned scissors, right? Because it still does still kind of have that same function of like the cutting, right? Um, even though we don't have things like sugar snippers anymore. OK, let's move on. We're um, going to do this photo, which is a little blurry. Um, but I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about it, right? Uh, we talked about all of the roles that women had during the American Revolution, right? Cooking, cleaning, child care, um, clothes. And this image is like like a painting, right? It's not a photograph and it's a little blurry and that's because there isn't a very good resolution of this uh, image anymore, but I put it in for a, a couple of reasons. One, it's outside and you can kind of see, you know, this looks like George Washington over here and we have soldiers on the ground, but and maybe you've noticed it. We have women in the background. And this is really interesting for a couple of ways because this is like a campsite. This is a military campsite and you're probably thinking, why are there women there? Women didn't fight in the Revolutionary War. They weren't allowed to fight. And so the reason I include this image is because this is an image that has women in it. And so it tells us that women were at these military campsites, that they were there. And so that is kind of the main reason of how women were involved in the Revolutionary War. They weren't fighting as soldiers, but they did something that we have later kind of coined in the army that we will see again show up in uh, World War One and World War Two. They did something called support roles and <coughs> excuse me, and they served really vital roles in camp life. And so when their husbands or fathers or brothers signed up to fight in George Washington's army, a lot of these women chose to follow their men to battle, right? Um, they were kind of faced with, with two choices that, right, they didn't have jobs, so they could either stay at their home without their husband and be subject to, you know, British occupation, these British soldiers there, 
or they were left to run the home all by themselves, you know, without uh, without any income of money. And many women thought that it would be safer to follow their men. And so a lot of women did. And they became a part of these military camp life. They would do jobs of taking care of the laundry, of taking care of sick soldiers, of cooking, of food, right? Um, these jobs that are important to having a well-functioning military that we don't actually think about. And so these women's jobs were so important that they received their own food rations. Um, and so they're often called camp followers for following these military campsites around, but they actually did very, very important jobs at these campsites. Um, and George Washington had mixed feelings about these women. He wasn't really, he wasn't really a super fan of them following his, uh, his military groups around. And he actually writes down in a letter to a friend that the multitude of women in particular, especially those who are pregnant or have children are a clog upon every movement. Um, and so I want you to think about that for a second, like why why they might have been a clog. And it's because you know, this is supposed to be a military. They are fighting at the time the best army in the world. And George Washington's army has women, it has small children, it has pregnant women. Um, I always say to to other students that if you have a younger sibling, think of them on road trips, right? Sometimes do they get whiny and then they ask, can I go to the bathroom or I'm hungry or I'm tired, right? Can you think of how hard that would be for an army? And so George Washington, he also realizes though that if he says no women, right? If he makes a rule that they're not allowed to come, that he's gonna have a lot, a lot of soldiers who will actually desert, who will leave the army. And so he decides to allow these women to stay. But we're actually gonna move on now. And I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about, um, about some of these women. And so we're gonna start with this lady up here. Her name's Deborah Sampson. And I want you to put into the chat if you think she was a spy or if she was in disguise. And you can use clues from the images you see up here, but then once you make your guesses, I'm gonna tell you about her story. And so we'll figure out what she did during the American Revolution. They are thinking, and um, we do have one question while they're thinking about the other question, is um, could women legally be in the military at this time? Ooh, good question. No, um, they couldn't. So women are not going to be allowed to join the U.S. military um, until World War II. That will actually be the first time that they are um, that they are allowed to serve and they will serve in something called the Women's Army Corps and they will also help out in the Air Force and the Navy, but um, not until World War II. So we believe, let's see, Jalen's going with disguise, Taylor says disguise, Lily says we've got a couple of spies. Looks like the spies are going to win, Hunter and Mandy, they're going with super spy. Absolutely spy. Okay, all right. Good guess. So I'm going to tell you about her story and then you put in the chat if you figured it out. So um, Deborah Sampson is supposedly, according to historians, the only woman to fight in the regular Continental Army. So in George Washington's army during the revolution. She walked to a town in Massachusetts, 75 miles from her home, and she enlisted as Private Robert Shirtliff. At one battle, Deborah actually gets shot in the side. She gets a little musket ball, which is like a bullet in the side. Um, but she decides to get up and keep moving. She does not go and seek medical attention. And the musket ball will stay inside Deborah Sampson until the day she dies. And so if you figured out what she is, you've probably figured out um, why she decided not to get medical help. Unfortunately, Deborah Sampson is discovered to be a woman when she when yellow fever hits the city of Philadelphia and she is admitted into a hospital ward because she is so sick. 
At this point, she has served a year and a half in the Continental Army and really surprisingly is given an honorable discharge from the Continental Army. After the war is over, she is going to receive a lifetime pension. Um, and all that means is that the government is going to give her a certain amount of money for the rest of her life because of her service uh, during the war. And so you've probably figured it out by now, but Deborah Sampson was actually in disguise. And that's because women were not allowed to fight in combat. So she disguised herself as a man to fight for uh, the revolutionary cause to fight for independence. And the reason that Deborah Sampson is considered the only woman, that's because we know about Deborah Sampson's story. We know because she was discovered to be a woman and there are records saying it and because she also talked about it herself. But for a lot of women, um, if they weren't caught and they didn't write their story down, and then they died, that story is lost with them. And so in a sense, it's also lost to history. OK, we're going to move on. We're going to move on to these two women here, and I want you to put into the chat if you think they're spies or in disguise, and there's a pretty big clue up here about what they might be. Um, and so I'm going to see if you're able to figure it out. Oh, good question. Again, students, are these women spies or are they in disguise? Hmm. As you are thinking through this, taking a look at some of the clues and the images and things, what's bringing you to it? So we've got a couple of spies listed. OK. And. So coming in, spy, 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 all spies. We're all going with spies. All right, you guys are like on it, right? These women are both spies, and I always think you can guess because written next to their name is something called either the button code or the clothesline code. Um, and probably drawing on your background knowledge, you can figure out that code might be associated with spy. So I'm going to tell you um, their two stories and you can figure out why it's called the button code or the clothesline code. And so women tended to be more successful in better hiding as spies than their male counterparts, right? So that's kind of why we often have more women that were spies and why they tended to be more successful. And for the most part, that's just because of the time that they grew up in, right? That men didn't think that, uh, women could fight in war, that they didn't have the guts or they couldn't be as brave, right? And so they're not always suspected as being spies. So Lydia Barrington Darrow, who we see on the left, she lived in Philadelphia and her home was used to house several high ranking British soldiers. So they lived in her house and Lydia would regularly spy on these soldiers by bringing in food or lighting the fire and then she would listen into their conversations. Um, and then what she would do is she would write any information that she overheard in a special like type of code and then she would put it in a tiny little piece of paper wrap that paper up and then she would hide it under cloth covered buttons on her son's coat um and this is a little interesting because it's not the buttons that we have today but buttons back then almost had a cloth over them um, so you couldn't see the button and so she would hide the message in between the button and it's like cloth covering and then her son would leave the house and take the messages to his older brother who was serving in the continental army under george washington and this is just a drawing it's just a recounting of lydia darrow as a spy um, so it's not we don't actually know if it's if it's a real if it's a real event that happened right it's the artist's imagination of drawing it and so this lady on the right her name is anna smith strong she also has a pretty clever way to pass on messages to the british or to the patriots i'm sorry george washington's army Anna Smith Strong is thought to be the only woman in George Washington's secret spy ring, and her job was to signal her fellow spy when she had information ready for him to pick up. 
So she would hang out her laundry in plain sight of the British, and she would hang a black petticoat that signaled there was a message ready to be picked up, and then a certain number of white handkerchiefs. And the number of handkerchiefs would relay the location of where this message was hidden. And we're going to move on really quickly because I know we're getting to the end of our time. And so women did not also did not just spy for the Patriots, right? Women also spied for the British. And this woman here on the left, her name is Anne Bates, and she was a teacher who gets recruited by the British to spy on George Washington's army. And so she's a little bit of both. She actually disguises herself as a peddler woman, as a poor woman, and she sneaks into George Washington's military camp in New York. Um, under the guise of, you know, being one of these camp followers. And so while she's there, she finds out information about how many soldiers there are, how many guns there are, how many cannons, where the weapons are located. And then she just leaves the camp and goes back to the British and tells them all of this information. And the British major who recruited her actually wrote that her information was by far superior to any other intelligence. And we're gonna go real quickly to the end, right? So we know how the Revolutionary War ends, right? Um, we know that George Washington and the Continental Army is going to defeat the British, that we're gonna become our own country, the United States of America. Um, and then also these women played very crucial roles in that fight for independence, even though we don't necessarily know their stories, but they are gonna go on to shape the way our military functions. They will fight again in the Civil War and in World War II, they will get officially adopted into the Army as the United States Women's Army Corps. And even now, uh, women are allowed to serve into the military in all branches of the military, whether in combat or in intelligence or in other types of ways. And they're able to do this all the way back um, to the very beginning of our country when women helped uh, win us our freedom and independence as well. And then also really quickly, because we talked about spying, I have one with me. This was a method of spying that they had during the American Revolution. This is a wheel cipher, um, and it was actually invented by our third president, by Thomas Jefferson. And it was an encryption device, right? So it had like turning wheels and you would have to like mess match up the messages to decode it. Um, but unfortunately, when Thomas Jefferson designed it, he made it a little too complicated and nobody could figure it out. And so it never actually caught on as a method of spying. Um, he pretty much gave it up. And even today, historians or cryptologists have been unable to crack it because they lost um, most of the of the codes, right? They they lost like the decoding um, keys. And so no one's really been able to figure it out. But they did use other methods of spying, like George Washington and his friend John Jay invented invisible ink um, that they used to write messages as well. So lots of kind of cool ways that they could that they could spy. Um, that was a lot of um, me talking, but I wanted to give you guys enough time for questions if you had any. So some of the questions that have popped in and um, one was about the cipher, like is that a fairly recent artifact or is that something that the museums had that's an old piece? Mm, so this one is actually like a replica. It's like a like a toy. Um, so you could like you could buy one if you wanted to if you wanted to use it. Um, so this is not actually the original. The very, very original is at um, Thomas Jefferson's home at Monticello um, in Charlottesville. Um, so this is just like a recreation uh, that you could buy or play with, but um, you probably couldn't write any actual secret messages because um, nobody knows nobody knows the key. Thomas Jefferson lost the key. So this is a replica, but we do have um, we do have older uh, like cipher codes like we have one from the Civil War in our collection and we have one from World War One in our archive collection as well. Beautiful. And so 
Um, Harper's going back to the question about the sugar snipper. Oh, yeah. Um, so they want to know if this is something that most families had and, you know, like how long has this thing been around? Mm. So the sugar snipper was probably created around the same period as the American Revolution. So it would have been created by someone who was a silversmith or a blacksmith, right, whose entire job was to create tools like this. Um, and it was basically just meant to make their life in the kitchen a little bit easier, right? When we think about tools that we have today, like why do we have things like scissors? Oh, because it makes it easier when we need to cut something, right? Um, so it was really designed to like help out in in the kitchen, but it, it fell, you know, out of out of function pretty quickly, probably, you know, as as soon as sugar was um, packaged in a bag, right? As soon as we had like loose sugar, you don't really need a sugar sniffer anymore. And we have time for one last question. Of our spies and in disguise women that you featured here, how did one of these stories get out? Like how did how did a woman get discovered or how do we know Correct. about the stories? Correct. Correct. Mm. Okay, um, so right most of the time when they were discovered, it was for something that they really couldn't control, like they got sick. Um, like in the case of Deborah Samson, she gets ill. And so when she's in the hospital and they're treating her, they find out that she's a woman. Um, other women are, um, so in like there's a case later in the Civil War of a very famous woman who spied and uh, she she gets injured. And so what she does is she actually ends up deserting. Like she leaves the army because she doesn't want to be discovered. Um, and so she just leaves, she takes off her disguise and she like returns to her life as a woman. And the man that she was disguised as gets labeled as a deserter. And so the reason that we that we know today that she's found out is because she writes about it. Um, she actually like publishes her own memoir and she says, oh, I was a I was a soldier during the Civil War. And um, she just she tells she tells people and she ends up going to uh, a reunion of her of her unit of her army group and um, meets with her other meets with her other her fellow soldiers and they say you know you were labeled as as a deserter you should really clear your name and so eventually she does but you know we know about her story because uh because she told us she wrote it down she told she told the public which i always kind of think is you know interesting but most of the time women were caught because of things they couldn't control like like sickness or injury or you know they they get they get shot, they get injured in battle, or they they die. Well, we sure appreciate you, Michaela, from joining us today. And yeah. students, I, I hope you found some great new information and some curiosities to extend your own research. So thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Yeah, thanks everybody. I hope you learned something new. Have a great rest of your Monday and week.